Lembramos a todos que este evento está sendo transmitido via streaming por meio de Fórum Permanente de Museus. Para acessar a transmissão, basta ir para o endereço e clicar na área do EPM. Este material também está sendo gravado e será disponibilizado também para futuras consultas no site do CISEM. Em continuidade ao nono encontro paulista de museus, informamos ainda que às 10h30, o secretário José Luiz Pena receberá prefeitos e secretários municipais de cultura para uma reunião na sala de Norá de Carvalho. Assim, pedimos que no devido horário, aqueles que forem participar desta reunião, por favor, peçam orientação às nossas assistentes do evento. Gostaria de registrar a presença e agradecer ao secretário adjunto da Cultura de São Paulo, senhor Romildo Campelo. Damos agora início à conferência, chamando o senhor... Franco Reinaldo, diretor do Museu da Diversidade Sexual, que mediará a mesa. Chamamos agora a senhora Uta Stapp, diretora executiva, e doutor Kevin Clark, conselheiro administrativo que representa o Chivuli Museum neste momento. A senhora Uta Stapp é graduada em Ciências Sociais, Política, Estudos Étnicos, Estudo de Negócios e Direito, em Gottingen. Após graduar-se e se mudar para Berlim, atuou como gerente de uma instituição educacional antes de começar a trabalhar como diretora administrativa do Chivuli Museum, em 2015. Durante este período, conduziu as candidaturas do museu com sucesso a financiamento externo para dois projetos expositivos relacionados à migração e refugiados queer, tópicos mostrados pela primeira vez no Chivuli Museum. Dr. Kevin Clark é jornalista e curador. Estudou musicologia e história da literatura na Freie Universität, Berlim, e na Universidade de Milão. Trabalhou como autor para diferentes jornais, bem como para estações de rádio. Foi editor-chefe da revista gay Manner, de 2011 a 2013. Escreve regularmente para o Queer DA, e desde 2014 é membro do Conselho de Administração do Chivuli Museum. Sejam ambos bem-vindos. Pedimos a todos que durante a conferência encaminhem suas perguntas por escrito ao mediador Sr. Franco Reinaldo, por meio das assistentes presentes no espaço. Estas perguntas serão respondidas ao final da conferência. Senhora Uta, Dr. Kevin, a palavra é de vocês. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for having us here. Uh, I apologize that our Portuguese is non-existent, so we will have to do this in English, but I hope you can understand us anyway. We are here not to present uh, the whole history of the Schwulis Museum, but basically... a larger institution and to a rather professional small museum in Berlin. And I feel very honored that of all the German museums, the Schwules Museum should be the first to be invited to Brazil to present itself uh, at a conference like this. So our special thanks go to the German consulate and its representatives here in the first row. Hello, I'm going to give you a short uh, introduction about the
It was extreme homophobic. And it was in the middle of uh, the AIDS crisis. So you had uh, also the leading parties um, being yeah, really homophobic. And it was a really important uh, step back then. It happened uh, that our one of the founding members um, started talking to the director of the Berlin Museum. The Berlin Museum um, claimed uh, for itself, you know, that it would represent the history of the whole city. And uh, it got clear that there was no representation about any lesbian or gay history. So they started talking and um, they got a little room, a little budget, and uh, to create this exhibition. Um, back then there was no archive, there was no material, so the people uh, who did the exhibition would um, go to flea markets and search for objects that would represent the history and also write, sorry, also write um, little uh, notes in newspapers asking the community to give objects that they would think would fit in the exhibition. Um, the Berlin Museum uh, back then was uh, divided. It was, you know, progressive people, but also really conservative people. And there was a big protest against this exhibition, actually. I think over 30 members left uh, the Berlin Museum. And so the director of the Berlin Museum then decided, okay, this is so important. We will cancel another exhibition, give you more room, and give you a bigger, bigger um, budget. So, um, in 1984, the first uh, exhibition ever about uh, gay and lesbian culture in a museum started in Berlin, and it was called El Dorado. It represented the history uh, from the culture from 1850 till 1950. Um, the People who did this exhibition thought that it would be like an initial spark in the German museum world and that other museums would follow their example and pick up the topic of gay and lesbian life as well. When that did not happen, they decided one year later to found their own museum um, and they called it Schwules Museum, which means male gay a museum, so it's a it's a very bad word in the German language. It's like faggot in English. So it was meant as a provocation, um, and it was also exclusively foc focusing on male culture because the women, the lesbians, who had originally been part of the El Dorado exhibition, separated themselves from this project and decided that they would do their own museum or their own museum space in the future. This led in December of 19. 85 to the foundation of the Schwules Museum back then without the asterisk at the end of the name uh, and it was a one room like a gallery space in a small side street and only five years later of small exhibitions did the museum move to Meringdam which is in Berlin Kreuzberg. It's an area you will all know from Hollywood movies and Netflix series. Uh, it's very popular today but back then it was a very off-center, very, very rough area, and the Schules Museum was in a backyard. You see the entrance from the old museum there. There were 700 square meters uh, divided on many levels. There were no elevators. Uh, there was no ramp access, so it was a very improvised museum uh, with an archive and with a library. It was next to a gay disco called Schwutz, which means Schwules Zentrum, gay cent center. It was next to a uh, at the AHA, which is a general homosexual um, group that had sex parties once a month, uh, right above the museum, and there was a cafe in the front. So it was a bit like a, a gay and lesbian, but mostly gay, uh, center of activity in Berlin-Kreuzberg. And it was privately funded at the time, so there was no state subsidy. Uh, there were members who paid an annual fee, and there were people who gave donations. Uh, and that's how the museum operated, and that's also how the archive started. Uh, as Uta mentioned, a lot of people were dying of AIDS at the time. And when they died, they very often gave their 
uh, possessions to the archive of the museum. So we have lots of books, photographs, private material. We have lots of pornography, uh, which is very important actually to represent the development of sexuality uh, in any museum. And so uh, I think we probably have the biggest collection in the world uh, because no other museum or library normally collects this kind of things. Here you see some of uh, the images of the museum. This is the first backyard where the museum entrance is. Uh, there was one exhibition space on the ground floor. Then you had to go through the door on the right side to the first floor where we had a permanent exhibition from 2003 onwards, but was only male gay history. Um, then you had to climb two more stairs and there was a smaller exhibition space. You had to walk through this hallway to the backyard, the second backyard, and there was the offices and the library and then the archive, uh, which was in boxes all over the place. There was no climatization and it was a very, very charming um, but very unprofessional way of being anywhere. Um, from 2000, but um, still the museum managed to establish itself as an institution over the next 20 years. And in 2010, the Berlin government, the Senate, decided to give an annual subsidy to the museum to honor the achievement um, of the building of such a museum. So in a way, it's the other way around than what you have here in Sao Paulo, where the government decided that it is important to have such a museum and, and start it from the ground, whereas we sort of had to struggle with volunteer work. Nobody was paid back then. And then only after 20 years, the government decided to give money. Uh, the money is 250,000 euros, which is roughly the same in, in dollars today. Uh, this is a very small amount compared with other museums that get funding in Germany uh, or other cultural institutions. So for example, one of the Berlin Opera Houses gets like 70 million euros. You can imagine what difference there is in, in size and, and, and importance. Uh, also there you see with the red scarf, one of the founding members of the museum, Wolfgang Theis, and, and the blue <laughs> pullover is Andreas Sternweiler, who started our collection of artwork, uh, which was later bought by the German government and then given to our museum um, as a donation. This is a look at the permanent exhibition which opened in 2004. Uh, as I mentioned, it was only about gay male history, so the lesbians were left out at the time. And it wasn't until 2008 that we had the first board member who was a lesbian and the first exhibition that covers lesbian history. And then it took another few years for the first transgender exhibition to happen at our space. And this is basically a sign of the opening um, of our museum, and that's also when the star, the asterisk, the all gender inclusive star, was added to our name. Here you see uh, how we moved. There were problems with the landlord. As I said, there was a gay disco, and there were other institutions in this building. The landlord realized at some point that it was a very hot new property to rent at a higher price, and he tried to change the rent for all of us. And the result was that uh, all the institutions by now have left that space, and they've all gone somewhere else. So once you had a, a space where all the gay institutions were in one house, and now they are dispersed all over the room. And it took the museum quite some time to find a different and bigger and affordable location um, where we eventually got a 10-year rental contract with controlled rent. Yeah, as Kevin already mentioned, it was in 2013 that we relocated. Uh, we moved from Kreuzberg to Tiergarten. It's really close to Neulendorfplatz, which is also a uh, quite historical place for the gay movement. And um, yeah, maybe I'll give you some, some numbers first that you have, a, have an idea. That whole uh, process of uh, moving and relocating costs uh, over 600,000 euros and was uh, funded by the city of Berlin and by the European Union. <clears throat> and um, uh, we had uh, one project manager who would uh, do all the organization. We had money for the 
uh, for the rebuilding, but um, as you will see later, our museum could never exist without great volunteer work. And so uh, the architect who did the design of the museum did this for free. He was also a member of the board. And uh, yeah. We now have uh, so much more space. We have uh, 1,000 square meters in total. And we have four exhibition rooms, uh, different sizes. Um, we have, uh, for the first time, a uh, separated archive, which is great because uh, before, you know, at Meringdam, the boxes with the objects were like uh, up, like in all three uh, floors. And sometimes you would have to look really long to find something. And um, yeah, now we have this big archive, a very nice uh, office as well. And for the first time, we have a cafe where we also can uh, host events. And that's something really important because, uh, you know, we have like two groups of uh, visitors. Mm, one are the tourists that mainly come like the first time to the museum and uh, who are rather interested in an overlook of uh, queer history in Germany. But you also have uh, like our members, people living in Berlin, and for them we try to, um, uh, yeah, to do a wide range of events because uh, it's one thing to preserve history and show exhibitions, but you also need some space for community building events, uh, theoretical discussions. And since we have this uh, cafe, we have very, very wide range of events like readings, uh, movie screenings, um, discussions, uh, musical events even, and uh, yeah. The numbers of uh, the, tour, the visitors uh, you've, like almost doubled. Until 2013, we had maybe 10, 11,000 visitors a year. And last year we had uh, 18,000. And this year, until last week, it was already 9,000 visitors, so. It really helped to get more people to the museum and uh, see, yeah. This is the new exhibition space. Um, and you see on the black uh, little architectural design on the side that there are four rooms. You can walk through them. They look much more professional uh, than the old museum was. Uh, I emphasize that they look more professional because we are still a very low funded museum. Um, so our budget for an exhibition that we can afford ourselves is 5,000 euros. Uh, this covers mainly the costs for paint transports, um, which means that most of the curators who work for us do this for free as volunteers, and they think it's an act of activism. Uh, they think it's important. Uh, we can also very rarely afford to pay people who come to give lectures or to do the frame program, but we are working on changing this because it excludes a lot of people who cannot afford to spend free time uh, for a museum. And this is especially for people with a migration background, many women who do not earn as much money as men. They all say that they cannot afford to work for free and we cannot afford to pay them, so we have to try to find a middle ground to bring the two groups together. Uh, this is the library in the first floor that we now have. Uh, all the books in our library are also donations. We do not have a budget to actually buy anything. Um, and every day people come to our museum with bags and boxes full of books, um, which sometimes go back to the 18th and 17th century even. So we do have a very important collection. And we also have a collection of all uh, LGBT magazines from the world, even from Brazil, and certainly all the German historical magazines that go back to the 19th century. You can see them in photocopies at our place, and you can look the real, look up the real, uh, the original versions as well. And as you see on the right side, we have about 11 workspaces where people can research. So this is something we did not have before at the other older, cooler museum in Kreuzberg. 
Our, this is a look of the archive, which is in the basement. We have about 1.5 million objects in our possession. Uh, all of them are donations. Uh, among them are about 5,000 photos, 25,000 books, and 5,000 artworks. They are not in our collection because they are particularly valuable as artistic uh, or money uh, investments, but they represent everyday life, uh, gay and lesbian life mostly, uh, of the past 100 years in Germany. And uh, as time goes on, we realize just how much more important they are to show how little things can be so expressive in telling how life in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s were, even though back then it was just a little object of no greater importance. Uh, on the left side, you see how the archive should look. These are the gray boxes. Uh, they are already um, systemized with, um, with words or with categories. And on the right side, you see how it still mostly looks, because it has to be sort of catalogued, and um, there have to be names given to it. And that takes time, and we need people to do it. And since we only work with volunteers mostly, uh, we always are dependent on a volunteer to volunteer to do this. Yeah, but we sometimes, uh, sometimes we're lucky and we get, uh, for instance, um, we have a great poster collection and we got uh, an extra funding for people to come and categorize everything, categorize everything. And yeah, I'll give you a little uh, idea about uh, the structure of the museum. As we said, uh, we could never survive without our great volunteers. We have uh, more than 50 people working there, and uh, I think only 12 are on the payroll. Nobody has a full job, it's all part-time. And we have uh, uh, volunteers in the museum, working at the cafe, uh, watching that nobody does something to the objects. Yeah. And we have uh, uh, volunteers in the as uh, Kevin already mentioned. And this is uh, actually a wall in our new office. And these are all the people that were involved, I think, around 2013 and made everything possible to memorize. Yeah, this is like the internal structure. At the top, like we are an association, and we have about now, I think, 230 members. Um, they pay an annual fee, which is quite an important part of our financial situation. Um, we have the board of directors, they get elected every two years and uh, are eight people. We have a curatorial board who um, discusses and decides what exhibitions will come, what we will show. Uh, you know, sometimes like we opened up a little bit more. Uh, I think when it started it was mostly people from the museum itself who did the exhibitions, right? Like, uh, and now we also get uh, requests from external curators who want to use the space, and yeah, that's very good. Also, if anybody in Brazil has a great idea for an exhibition, please contact the curatorial board. We are always open to new suggestions, and we actually depend on them as well. Yeah, yeah we will talk. With I them. will. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, we already did. <laughs> and let's see what else? Uh, yes, you can see some, you know, we have two people working in the press or head of the archive, head of administration, which is me. Um, and yeah, but without the volunteers, this would never, never, never work. Maybe I'll give you a little idea of the numbers. Um, uh, as Kevin already said, until 2010, we only could finance ourselves through uh, the member fees through the entrance, through donations, and for certain projects we would write external fundings. Like one exhibition a year could be funded externally, all the other exhibition had a budget of 5,000 euros. 2010, uh, we got the funding finally from the city of Berlin. Uh, back then we had a gay mayor, Klaus Wovereit, I don't know if you know him. Um, and uh, yeah. This year, we actually got a raise of uh, almost 100,000 euros, which is really, really great. Because the costs, uh, you know, from this 250,000 euros, we can uh, pay the rent and pay our, the people who work there. Everything else needs to come through other money. And, yeah. 
We had one very, very big and very, very successful exhibition in 2015. It was called Homosexualities, plural and with a gender gap um, sign. Uh, this was a collaboration with the Deutsche Historische Museum, which is the German National History Museum. It is probably the most important German history museum uh, in the whole country. And uh, this meant that for the first time, our small museum and the topics that we usually show in our small museum moved to a very large museum. And this created maximum visibility. Uh, this project was funded by the German government or by the cultural institutions of the German government with 1.5 million euros. Just to give you a relation between the 5,000 euros we normally have, 1.5 million for this. The exhibition was shown at the National History Museum and at our place. There was a big poster campaign. You see the poster here behind you, um, which costs 70,000 euros. Uh, it was all over Berlin and it caused a lot of discussion because many homosexual men said this does not represent them. Many lesbians said it doesn't represent them. Many people asked why plural, why a gender gap, what does gender have to do with homosexuality. So we had a lot of the discussions uh, surrounding this exhibition that Franco has at his museum as well. Um, because of the big visibility of this, there were about 25,000 visitors at our place and more than 100,000 visitors at the National History Museum at the same time, so it was a very big success. Also, the feedback to this exhibition was very positive. Many LGBT people from Germany said that it was important for them that they were represented in a national history institution. And um, as you now see maybe in England with the Tate Britain who have a queer British art exhibition, exhibition, once you bring these topics to a major museum, you get more acceptance, newspapers, media to covers your stories, uh, but when we do it, the same topics in our small museum, they say, oh no, it's only a minority issue, we do not have to report on it. So it's very important for us to get these collaborations with other institutions and to move from our little space together to the bigger space. Oh, damn it, I already said everything to that. Right? Yeah, here you see the event space. This is one of the exhibition spaces that we have, and we have uh, we open it for concerts. This is actually a concert in our current Wagner exhibition. Um, this is something that the old museum didn't have. Uh, of course, in Berlin, you have various spaces for discussions, for lectures, for queer life. Uh, the museum is not trying to be competition with these other places, but we are trying to give something extra. And we are normally trying to have the events in the context of the topics of our exhibitions. Yeah, and I think, you know, the important thing is we're not, uh, like from where we came from, we are a movement uh, museum. And so this is why it's important to have the space to invite the community, to also invite the community to take part. You know, sometimes people come and, like, we don't always organize all the events. People from the outside come and make suggestions and then uh, fill, fill the space. And uh, I think that's very important to keep connected to, yeah, the community and the base. And it's very important to keep the museum in a live space because many people go to the museum once, they look at the exhibition and they leave and that was it. Uh, we want to make people, we want to invite people to come many times, like once a month, maybe twice a year. Uh, that's something that has changed since we moved to the new place. A lot of gay and lesbian people in Berlin said, oh, we saw the museum maybe 10 years ago. Why should we come again? We know the permanent exhibition, but we have changing exhibitions every every three months, maybe every two months even. Um, so this is an invitation to the Berlin community to visit us again and again and to participate and to start a dialogue with us also. Yeah, here you see the cafe in a not such a good <laughs> photo, but uh, it can be used for parties, it can be used for events, for lectures, for concerts, as Uta said. Uh, you see a bit of the cafe in the background there. 
Uh, as I already mentioned, originally it was a, a gay male museum, then we had a lesbian board member, we had lesbian exhibitions, now we try to divide it like half-half. Uh, we have opened up to the trans community. Uh, this is not yet reflected in our archive, which was built mostly by gay men, white men, uh, over 30 years. Um, but we want to send out signals to the world that we are open to others. So 2018, we will change our name to Lesbian Museum, uh, and then maybe the next year to Bisexual Museum, Transgender Museum, and Intersexual Museum, just to show to the community that we are a place for everyone and nobody needs to feel excluded. However, we have kept the name Schwules Museum when we moved uh, because we thought it has established established itself as a brand over 30 years and it's really not a good idea to change a established name um, just because the political debates has changed but this is again a topic of big discussion that we are having at the moment <laughs> so now we're looking forward to your questions é, obrigado, Uta, obrigado, Kevin, pela presença. Para a gente, é com muito orgulho que a gente recebe vocês aqui no Brasil, nessa época que é uma época de comemoração, digamos assim, de orgulho. Né? A gente está no mês da diversidade sexual, da, da parada LGBT. Né? E, enfim, mas eu acho que tem... Essa primeira pergunta, acho que é muito importante, porque reflete um pouco a situação que a gente vive aqui, né? a mesma violência, a mesma discriminação que a nossa comunidade sofre, a gente acaba sendo refletida no nosso espaço ali na República, né? com pichações, com chutes no vidro, é, com pessoas que entram e de alguma forma nos ofendem, então a gente também é um espaço de resistência e, eu não, e essa pergunta é um pouco sobre isso para vocês. Né? Não tenho o nome da pessoa, mas a pergunta é, por tratar de um espaço, por tratar de um tema que pode suscitar controvérsias, o museu já sofreu atentados contra o seu acervo ou edifício? Ah, que medidas de segurança são usualmente tomadas pelo museu? Yeah. Okay, um, I have to say I've been working at the museum for two years now, so within these two years uh, there was, uh, I think, one really big incident and it was, uh, I think, in February 2015 where uh, we discovered that there had been uh, shoot, shooting holes? Shots. Shots. Uh, at our window right next to the entrance and um, if you remember you know we have this big uh, sign above our entrance Schwudes Museum it was right the windows below them so we had to call the police uh, they had you know they were doing all their investigations unfortunately it didn't uh, bring any results but two weeks later uh, we have a French school right next uh, to the Schwules Museum. They found uh, shots there too. So we are not really uh, sure whether this, this is really uh, like just a homophobic uh, shooting or whether it was just stupid young people because you know there was a conflict with the French uh, students and we're not too sure. Of course, everybody was really uh, worried at the beginning but then we try to relax a little bit more and say hey we will not this will not uh, uh, we will, won't give those people who did this the power to make us more insecure and uh, yeah we will not uh, let this ruin us our work um, we don't have as I saw in the museum we don't have a security guard who's always walking around or checking out we don't have that, but I think uh, Berlin itself is a very special city. Um, of course, there's, there's still homophobic, homophobic uh, violence, but not as much as it used to be or in maybe other parts of Germany, and of course, as here, as I learned. And, yeah, that's it. Uta mentioned that we have a lot of volunteers who work at our place. They are mostly older gay men, and they discussed the shooting, of course, um, and some of them said, you know, we've lived through so much 
that was much worse. We are not really worried about a few shots at our windows. So this is the attitude that they took. Uh, but to just give you an example of what they do really worry about. Uh, at the moment, the current German government or the Berlin government has a plan to put all the gay and lesbian and trans archives into one building um, and to make it a like a queer lighthouse uh, institution for Berlin. And some of the older gay men in our museum, when they heard about this plan, were really worried because they said, if all these archives are now in one place, someone just has to set fire to one building and then everything will be wiped out. So this, for many who, people who organized this idea of the, of the queer lighthouse, haven't thought about it. Um, and it was one of the reasons why they prefer to keep it spread out all over the city so that if an attack comes, it will just erase maybe one archive and not everything together. A segunda pergunta é, antes, antes de mudar de local, o museu concebeu um plano museológico específico para a ocupação do novo edifício? Uh, no. The museum always had three different rooms, uh, also in the old space, so basically the idea was to just move to a bigger space and continue doing what we did before. What changed, however, is our permanent exhibition. Uh, as I mentioned, we added the star as an all gender inclusive sign to the world. Uh, when we moved to the new location, we decided that we cannot take the old permanent exhibition with us because it was mostly gay male history. And uh, we thought that if we have a permanent exhibition at the new space, it will have to include lesbian and transgender history as well, if not all groups of the LGBTIQ plus movement. So that's the one thing that we decided to not take with us and to start fresh. It hasn't started yet because it involves money, it involves people to do it. When we moved to the new location, we had a big financial problem because it was so much work to move all those boxes and it actually cost more than we expected and we had a big debt of about 60,000 euros for two years and because of that financial problem we didn't have time to focus on the new permanent exhibition which is something that we are working on right now. Yeah, and maybe I can add something. Uh, what you should understand is um, we don't have an asso association like this uh, in Germany. Or if, yeah, we do, but we're not part of this. We're really like we, we come from this uh, very movement DIY uh, scene and start now to go into a more professionalizing uh, concept. Um, but. Yeah, as I said, you know, it's a, it was activists who, who started and who continued to work there for a long, long time. And so like a muse musical pl muse museum plan is something that uh, I read about this, but uh, I've never uh, worked with it at the museum. Maybe I can say that one of the big plans for the future is to show that LGBT history is not a minority issue, but it's an issue, gender and sexuality, that concerns everybody in our German society, I would say even in all societies. So we are trying to move away from being just a niche product to, a, to attract a larger audience and to, to make sure that everybody sees also, also through cooperations that we are dealing with majority issues here. Okay. Outra pergunta. É, na mudança de local, decidiu-se levar todo o acervo ou houve o descarte de peças, conforme uma política de acervo do museu? Of course we took everything, uh, because uh, now we have the place to uh, finally put it into a professional archive. Um, and uh, we finally had the space to even get more and more and more objects. Um, Inheritance. Yeah. Uh, as Kevin already mentioned, you know, we got some inherited... Inheritances. Inher uh, sorry, my English today is not very good. Um, and one of it was uh, a whole apartment. It was money and it was a whole apartment from uh, a gay activist that we got. And uh, this also will move this summer to, to our archive and it's so, like this would have never been imaginable in the old museum. 
So actually, our institution, the, the 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 society of the museum, has a law or a regulation that says that we will accept everything. So we do not turn people away when they come to us. We only, when we have things double or three times, we will discard something. But we do actually take everything in because you don't know in 20, 30, 40, 50 years whether it might be an important um, document of the time that we are living in right now. Yeah, and maybe I can say that as well. Since uh, we got the higher, uh, higher money for next year, uh, we will have to rent additional space to the archive because this 500 square meters are not enough anymore. Because, you know, I think uh, within the last years, for different reasons, for the big exhibition, you know, from, we have more visibility and more people uh, actually also want to give something to us and uh, contribute to saving the history. Ok, a gente tem ainda 15 minutinhos. Eu vou. Tem três perguntas aqui que tem a ver com o educativo do museu, né? Então eu vou ler elas na sequência. O museu realiza alguma atividade pedagógica com a comunidade escolar? Há algum trabalho educativo voltado às escolas ou à comunidade no encontro do museu, no entorno do museu, perdão? E qual a frequência de visitação escolar deste museu? Há resistência na educação básica para a discussão dessa temática LGBT? Um, also, this uh, is uh, because we had not enough money. Um, lots of volunteers uh, worked at the um, educational program. We have, uh, yeah, we have, we are establishing quite a wide range about that. Um, since you asked about schools, this is something that also started within the last four years, I would say. Uh, we have special guided tours for school classes, and it's so great to see that the interest in that gets higher and higher and higher because, you know, if you want to change something or if you want to fight for uh, acceptance, of course, you need to start young. <laughs> and um, it's uh, so beautiful to see all those open young people. Uh, also, with the higher money we will get, we will get more people to do the educational program. Um, we didn't show you our current projects. One of them is uh, about the Winkelmann, uh, a German cultural uh, scientist from 300 years ago. And um, we had a workshop with a school class uh, for a whole week. And uh, they did uh, like a sign and uh, were uh, looking for um, the yeah, story of homosexuality 300 years ago. And so, yeah, there are many, many projects for schools, like or some projects for schools. As it is always, it uh, can't, you know, it can't be enough. You know, we should get bigger and uh, do more. We also are in, in we're working uh, with an association called Youth in the Museum, uh, who is you know, trying to bring the youth uh, into the museums. And we organized actually some comic workshops, some vacation comic workshops, you know, where the students could come and um, work, uh, like try to uh, think about queer, gender, migration, and put that uh, into a comic. But unfortunately, uh, nobody would show up. Because I think, and that's still a problem, because you know, there are, there is still homophobic in uh, the society, or pe like maybe some parents wouldn't really want to give their children into the Schwules Museum, the gay museum, and so, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the classic problems. You see parents in the summer holidays uh, want to find something that their children can do, and they look at a list, and then they send them to a workshop with a technical museum or with a natural history museum, and then they see Schwules Museum, which means faggot museum, and they think, ooh, if we send our children there, who knows, they might be molested, they might be converted to homosexuality, and um, that's a very big problem. It's not outright homophobia. They wouldn't say, oh, no, we're against homosexuals in general, but when, the, when it comes 
to sending their own children to such an institution, it's another topic. Um, two years ago, we had a children's exhibition or an exhibition about a children book writer uh, that's very famous in Germany, and we thought maybe children or young children would come. And I asked my own sister, who works at the kindergarten, to come with her group. And she told the parents in her kindergarten that they would come. And they were panicking, saying, why are you going to Schwules Museum? Are there going to be penises everywhere? Are there going to be vaginas everywhere? Uh, are the children going to be safe? Is there pornography everywhere? And um, they wanted to see pictures first be before they entered this building. So this just shows you there are these fears still and the only way to get over the fears is to actually show our museum on TV, in newspaper articles, to show that it is possible to enter our museum and not be raped as soon as you walk through the door. <laughs> and yeah, one more thing maybe. Uh, we offer, I don't know how it is in uh, your museums here, but you know, I know your museum has no entrance. We, we do because we depend on it. Yeah. And normally if you... Um, if you want to guide a tour, you will pay for that, but uh, we give two uh, free guided tours every week and uh, this is also something that was established not so long ago and it really attracts more and more people, you know, to, it's always at the same time and that's something that is quite helpful, I think. Continuando, continue, uh, continuando essa pergunta que você fala dos ingressos, tem uma pergunta sobre receitas, como o museu consegue suas receitas, além dos voluntários que vocês explicaram aqui. Se tem bom ingresso, já foi dito, loja de produtos, palestras, etc., com, hum, ah, o café e eventos, se esses eventos são pagos e ajudam a sustentar o museu. Yes, uh, since I started working there, or that was uh, something uh, that I actually started quite early. Um, since we were like a community uh, project, um, there was this, uh, it was, you know, many groups who are somehow connected to somebody would always ask for free entrance and uh, it was quite a big habit. And uh, so then we decided, look, we really need the money, so we need to change that. That was one important step. We have, since we relocated, we have the place for a bigger museum shop. And uh, since one of our lovely uh, uh, volunteers uh, took over there, um, the money, the, the income that, gets, that comes from the museum shop is also getting higher and higher. We uh, have a collaboration with a queer bookshop and for every new exhibition we always order books uh, that deal with a topic regarding to the exhibition. We have uh, lovely souvenirs, we have uh, postcards and we also have a cafe and uh, since you know more people are coming of course there comes more money for drinks. And uh, last year, for instance, we made uh, 33,000 euros in the shop and the cafe. You know, so if you think about getting 250,000 euros, it's a, it's quite a quite an important uh, fact actually. The events um, also cost money; they cost less a little bit. They only cost the reduced uh, fee. And there is one free, uh, like regular event, the Queer Kitchen, that happens every, like one Sunday every month. And that's like a community building event, you know, where we, like, uh, we, it's a changing topic from, from uh, meeting to meeting. And we have like a short input uh, speech, and then the people who come are invited to discuss and not, you know, not to always lecture people, but also to discuss a little bit more. Okay, we have five minutes. I will try to put together a question here. Okay, uh, eu vou tentar juntar algumas questões aqui. É, existe algum estudo sobre o impacto social do museu? A mudança para um novo espaço maior permitiu uma aproximação com outros membros da comunidade, além de gays e lésbicas? Aparentemente, o museu é um sucesso entre a comunidade LGBT, mas como ele é recebido pelo restante da comunidade? É sobre o social impacto e como... O resto é gay? 
the queer community or the rest of the yes, community? Yes, no, no, no. It means like the, the social impact of museum, yeah. how this establishes a relation with the other the other people from the society, not just gay okay. people, gay, if you have this. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, we are the first and oldest gay history museum in the world, so the impact that we had was that we inspired uh, other museums in the world uh, to follow our example, which is quite nice to see, but it took a very long time. Uh, there is a GLBT museum in San Francisco, which started in 2010. So just to give you, you know, from 1985 to 2010, that's quite a long time. Then in 2011, you have the Gay and Lesbian Art Museum in New York, the Leslie Lohman Museum. Uh, for five years, you've had your Museum of Sexual Diversity here. It shows you that basically we were very much ahead of our time, uh, which is a bit surprising because you would have thought that big gay centers in the world like San Francisco, London, New York, Amsterdam would have had their museums long before we would have had it, but it always takes some crazy person um, to exploit themselves to start something like that. At least in Germany, that's the way it's done. Um, as far as the acceptance from the mainstream society is, it's a very uh, complicated um, issue. When we were in the small space where we were, that I showed you earlier, the mainstream society could just basically ignore us and we were only sometimes covered in the media. When we move to the bigger space, uh, we get more visibility and certainly with the Homosexualitäten, the big exhibition in 2015, everybody s took notice of us and they still do take notice of us, but it doesn't mean that we get regular coverage in the mainstream media and the normal reaction to this would be uh, you know you're a small museum we can cover you every two three months um, so maybe every five years there would be an article uh, now interestingly enough the international media is covering us and then that reflects back onto the german media so for example we had a, an exhibition on the gay son of richard wagner one of the most famous german composers the german press mostly ignored it and then le monde in Fran france wrote about it el mundo in spain wrote about it and then a german radio station saw that article and then they reported on it so sometimes you have to sort of establish yourself in the world maybe even in Brazil, for it to reflect back positively to Germany. But I think in general, the acceptance of uh, in the current German society for a museum like ours is pretty high. Yeah, and uh, as uh, Kevin already said, you know, we, we don't only, uh, or there's always a connection to the mainstream, or there can always be a connection to the mainstream. Just because uh, we are an LGBT museum doesn't mean that uh, um, people, heterosexual people can't uh, connect to the topics. Wagner, for instance, Winkelmann, this huge uh, historic uh, person, this very important person, is also, you know, quite spread in the uh, mainstream. And but I would like to give you one maybe final example of what the challenge is. Uh, the Homosexualitäten exhibition was at the German National History Museum. It was very successful. The feedback from people that they questioned was 99% positive, which is very unusual. And all the people said it was so important to be represented in this institution. Um, so of course, the German National History Museum in their main collection, permanent exhibition, has a lot of gay, lesbian, and trans characters, topics that they could just highlight if they wanted to, but they don't. Um, so that's the next big step. How do you get the big mainstream institutions, museums, whether it's art museums or history museums, to just actually mention that some of the artwork there has a homoerotic, queer, or LGBT context and just not ignore it? I remember a discussion with the director of the His German National History Museum and they said, well, we did this homosexualities exhibition, so now for the next 25 years we don't have to bother with it again. And I think that's not the right approach. We are trying to show that you should always emphasize it. The British Museum in London has done it with a little uh, special guided tour where they present the, the, the queer objects from their permanent exhibition. and. Uh, German National History Museum could easily do it too if they wanted to do it. Tem uma última pergunta rapidinho que é, é when you say gay culture, what does that concept comprehend? Quando vocês falam de cultura gay, o que esse conceito compreende? 
In Berlin, of all places, uh, there is a very active queer scene and there's very violent discussions at the moment between the different groups. Um, so lesbians don't want to have anything to do with transgender. Uh, women who are lesbians and, and the gay white male men don't want necessarily something to do with the trans movement and with the queer movement and what does queer mean actually. Um, so a lot of people in Berlin at the moment in the academic circles and within the queer society are very violently attacking each other. It's not exactly a very healthy or productive discussion, but it needs to be done. And of course that reflects what we do at our museum as well. How much people, with, people of color do we present? How much migration background do we present? How do we structurally change that? So that is one of the big challenges we face on a small level, but it basically represents what's happening in the queer scene in general and in society, in German society in general as well. Okay. Bom, eu gostaria de agradecer o Kevin e a Uta pela presença, pela participação, agradecer a todas e todos vocês uh, pela presença em nome do Museu da Diversidade Sexual. Queria convidar a todos e todas a visitar nosso pequeno espaço, mas que é feito com muito orgulho. Muito obrigado. Agradecemos as perguntas e a senhora Uta e Dr. Kevin pela conferência. Agradecemos também o Museu da Diversidade Sexual pelo trabalho integrado e o Consulado Alemão de São Paulo pela parceria que permitiu trazer nossos conferentistas. Lembramos a todos que este evento está sendo transmitido via streaming e que este material também está sendo gravado e será disponibilizado no site do CISEM. Lembramos ainda que na sacola entregue no credenciamento vocês encontrarão sugestões de locais para almoço. Foram mapeados lugares próximos do teatro para garantir que todos possam se deslocar facilmente e retornar a tempo para a programação na parte da tarde.